during the transition. Uh, my name Thanks. is John Cooksey. Um, I'm signing. Just really really nice. oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I've never worked um, with. Oh, I've seen your I've seen your name on um, yeah, various. Uh, okay. I'm on the Tabar uh, <laughs> Slack channel, and um, I don't post very often. <laughs> oh, whoops. <laughs> It's called uh, innovation. Right. I could have uh, done this from home with, on that basis. Um, so hands up if you're in a company of, say, up to five people. So between five and 50, and 50 to 500, so 250 or something. Okay, great. Um, and I guess what we find is companies grow from five people to 50 people under 500 people that it starts to evolve and it starts to feel less like a family and more like a business. Um, you know, when you've got five people, it's easy to talk about the footy because customers don't get in the way, so the boss seems quite friendly. Um, a client of mine at the moment is going through a similar thing, sort of between 35 and 100 people. Uh, the team's complaining that they don't get much access to the leader now, they don't quite understand uh, where the business is heading, they don't quite feel like they're connected, and they're kind of wondering, you know, what's happening in the, in the business. Um, today I'm just going to reflect on how organisations can, I guess, follow a path or a system, if you like, to connect with their employees all the way through. We've heard a lot about lean and agile and changing organisations and projects and technology moves things quicker and slower. Um, one of the things I think that's particularly important, though, is making sure we capture people on the way through. So I'm going to go through the talk and use uh, a personal experience, if you like, rather than tell you that I've worked in places that were fantastic because I worked there. Um, I'm going to use more of a family sort of uh, example to give you a sense of of how we've perhaps gone about it. But before we start, I want you to think back to a time in life when you felt really connected, like a sense of affinity. So maybe it was when you're with family, it might be that you're in a sporting organisation, uh, out in the community garden, it might be working with the CFA, it might be with another volunteer group, uh, it might be with a community organisation. And perhaps have a think about why you felt connected, why it was that that was good for you. Maybe I'll get a, sh a show of hands for this. So maybe it was because it was fun. Anybody felt connected because it was fun? It was nice and social. It was with friends. Uh, you were needed, so your skills were being used in a very specific way. So some of us work as advisors in businesses that aren't our own, but we're able to help because we've got a unique sort of skill. And I think, for me, one of those times was uh, I helped start a community choir called Stairwell to Heaven. So not Stairway to Heaven, which is the, the song by the band that can sing and play, but this is a choir called Stairwell. And the reason it was Stairwell is because we were in the Stairwell of a primary school. Um, and we were all connected because we had parents at the, uh, kids at the school, so it was kind of united against the common foe. Some of our kids were, weren't all that pleasant at times. But we have a really good sense of community, and we learned how to sing gospel and pop and rock and roll, and then we'd be tied to the pub and talk about politics. So, you know, for the first part of this year, with a couple of elections, you know, going to choir was pretty cool. We could actually talk about things that we felt connected to um, rather than some of the things that we were stuck doing on a day-to-day -day basis at work. And my experience as a father and a teacher of martial arts and having been a founding member of that, that choir and in some sporting organisations, etc., I think I've come to recognise that it's as much about that first sense of affinity, if you like, or connection for people um, it's because of that that we have New Year's resolutions, like we're all going to go to the gym six times a week and we're going to you know, turn out in the spirit of lean and agile. I've got a great video, by the way, if you want to look at it later, of me riding the uh, juice bike. I sent that to my kids, told them I'm at a lean and agile conference. I think it's quite impressive. I actually understood the, the joke too, which I thought was quite good. Um, so it starts with that sense of affinity. That's why we have love at first sight. That's why we had a whole bunch of other things. That's why occasionally we've joined a job in a company that didn't turn out to be the job we should have taken, right? Because this is going to be bloody great. Um, but then what I think is important over time is that there's then a sense of roles and behaviours and outcomes and benefits that go with that. So, you know, that might be going into a personal relationship, getting married, going into a job, into a new community. But what you get with that is a sense of energy. So that comes with that comes energy for the individual, energy for their business partners, energy for the team energy for the organisation, and if we continue to apply a sense of, I guess, what's required, 
but also the benefits, which is only a natural right because we're human, that will eventually lead to synergy. And with synergy, you get uh, high-functioning teams, you get customers actually listening to you and working with you on a regular basis. And the challenge with a lot of organisations and a lot of project-based organisations is the affinity is a big part, there's a few roles and behaviours, but it's not a consistent engagement and therefore you don't get a consistent sense of energy. The energy drops, there doesn't become synergy, and synergy doesn't have to be a lifeline, a lifetime activity. It needs to be within the, the realms of a project or within the, the realms of a, a role. So I think it's really important that people follow that path both in projects but also with employees in organisations. And typically in an organisation that will fall to an HR person, companies will go, we need an HR person. Um, if they don't have one, then that falls with the business owners who are becoming increasingly uh, busy with sales plans, marketing plans, technology plans, uh, investment strategies, mergers, etc. And what I want to do is walk through how that might work. So I thought it's we should take a step back, just touch on the HR space. One of the things I find businesses are challenged by is they don't actually know how all the parts of HR connect. Um, so back in the day, over here in the basics, everybody kind of worked in the same job, doing the same things in the same sorts of organisations, whether that was plants um, on the land. So it pretty much was about finding them and paying them properly. Around the 90s, the concept of employee champions started to emerge and then Somebody this morning in one of the talks talked about the fourth industrial revolution with more complex business environments, cross geographies, partnerships, project teams and agile. And we started to add things that were, that were slightly more strategic in nature, visions and values, employee engagement and, and culture. And the impact of technology um, had really had a big impact on that. I guess across a typical business life cycle, going from a startup to a scale up to a company in growth, there are certain aspects that uh, change, whether it's the sales approach or the marketing plans. And I believe that for an employee, that kind of happens too when they go into a role in an organisation. I think they follow a similar sort of path. There's a sense of workforce foundations, and there's an aspect of talent management. And again, this can be a project orientation or throughout the employee's career, and then they have the ability to have an impact on the excellence of an organisation. And if all of those things are taken care of, then the business future for the company will be positive and will continue to evolve. Quite often I think companies start and add all the employees and then they go back to the project, the sales, marketing and finance parts, whereas in reality, if the technology that you dive into doesn't work, if the employees are engaged, then they'll continue to deliver. Now your organisation might be sitting somewhere on that cycle, in fact it may ebb and flow again based on the nature of your business, whether it's a project oriented business or whether it's a manufacturing style business which is probably slower to move. What I'm going to do is walk through each of these different aspects, workforce foundations, talent management and organisational excellence and map them to a path or a system if you like for employee performance. Um, so for us, uh, this slide probably went down better in Sydney than in Melbourne, but at one stage, San Antonio, uh, Juan Antonio Samaranch declared Sydney the best Olympics ever. I'm pretty sure he said the same thing. Well, he didn't. Somebody did in 1956, but in 2000, that's when he did it. And uh, about the same time, we embarked on our own uh, Olympic journey or marathon, if you like, after months and months of uh, hard work and endeavour and good diet and staying fit and uh, working on our collaboration strategies, uh, we decided to have a child using IVF. So we started our own organisation. So we created our own company, we got our own employees, and we used at the time probably not a very expensive recruiter. I think the IVF guy only charged four and a half thousand. So it was like recruiting, you just go to them, in essence they say, do you want a baby? You say yes, they go, have you got four and a half grand? You go yes, they go great. There's a few more things to that, but it's not, not much more sophisticated. And then we started our onboarding process as parents, so Ironically, not long before that, I was the HR director for KFC and we had one way to cook a chicken and in hospital there were five ways to feed a baby, right, which I didn't quite get. And I said to the lady that came in when I was completely frustrated, you look important because she had lapels. She goes, oh yeah, I said, right, I need you to tell me how to feed my child because 
if not mistaken, of, of it work at Gartner, as it turns out, from five in the morning to three in the afternoon, and then be on baby duty for the rest of the cycle and go again. So, and I said, if you can, if you say to me, hold him like this and take all your clothes off and go into the hallway, and I go out there and there's other people out there doing the same thing, I'm in. And I guess that goes to show you the importance of having appropriate structures and how simple some things you know, can be in order to get performance. So with Lachlan, he was born with a neuromuscular condition. Uh, looks like cerebral palsy, the untrained eye, but it's not. Uh, it's called neurofibromatosis. But he has low muscle tone, uh, was unable to play mainstream sport, um, and generally was not all that attractive to other mates, if you like, the way young children tend to bond. Um, so we needed to find something for him to do. So we got him into an organisation called Little Athletics. Anybody done Little Athletics when they were a little bit younger? Yeah, no, people, you kind of got the idea, people were running around generally Saturday mornings for way too long in the heat in summer. Um, that's the parents that didn't seem to care. But, um, but as an organisation, they're a bit like a startup or a scale up, um, happy to attract people who are just happy to be there. Um, these guys didn't know at the time, but they all turned into millennials. They didn't, the term wasn't invented, I think when they started. Um, and so he fell into a company. So new employee, company's little athletics. The challenge for Lachlan when he started was he couldn't run 800 metres without stopping, couldn't jump off both feet. Uh, so he wasn't really the ideal employee. In fact, you probably be looking for a refund from the recruiter. We couldn't go back to the United States guys. That's, um, <laughs> that's our problem with his, right? But I imagine we contributed a little bit. Our gene pool was in there somewhere. But um, we'll work it out. But the challenge with that though is he was in essence in a role that he wasn't all that good at. Now they inducted him, so you can see there he's got the Balmain shirt on which is really cool. Um, but, and they also, and they taught him how to run and jump and all those sorts of things at the time, so we've doubled on that with new employees. Uh, they even let him go to the zone car carnival which is uh, a good thing because it was inclusive but also set him up to fail because he can't straighten his leg. So, and we were targeting the walk with all, against all the normal kids because eight got into the region, there was only six, all he had to do was finish and hang out with the cool kids at a region carnival, but he got disqualified because he can't straighten his legs, right? So, a good example of putting people into a team or in an organisation where you're doing all the right things but you haven't actually put them into the right gear. Now, they didn't know that at the time because he was, well, probably the most challenged kid. He came last in every event for five years. And, in the spirit of lean and agile, we literally measured every event on a spreadsheet. We improved 400 metres by 100 metres at a time for six years. Such was the, the focus on the performance for the role. It's not always great when you decide that you're to out your child as a disabled person, but we decided for him to do better. We needed to put him into a different job. So we're going to classify as a para-athlete which is not a Paralympic athlete, he's not good enough to do that because he's got my lungs, um, but he's a para-athlete nonetheless. So we got him classified as a para-athlete and then he was in a new role working with new people on a new project. Um, and in doing that he started to get some success, which reflected on him, which is quite nice, on us, which was kind of cool, uh, and also on his club. But in this instance it reflected really well on his school and the other people in his school. So he won a ribbon at a state carnival in the school system and became then the first person in that primary school to ever win a state medal. So you can see the contribution that he made for the school and himself, which is like having you know an average employee delivering the best outcome your business has had for a while. And my point is around making sure the right people are in the right job and it's actually defined for them. Because when the technology breaks, they'll still be able to contribute. To enhance his development, we moved him into a different school. So you can imagine when he was little and small and he was uncoordinated, uninteresting, hopeless Lachlan. So we moved him into another primary school and in the space of one year, he became the vice captain and won the cultural excellence award for contributions to the school. Because he again was moved into a different team and the right environment and able to use the skills that he developed over time, which if we hadn't taken the effort to micromanage his development, he never would have achieved. And then from a 
performance perspective with the right rewards and, and encouragement, he eventually won a couple of state medals. Um, but that's a reflection on the people that have contributed, not necessarily individual talent. So when I talk about getting the performance right, learning and development and encouraging results, benefit, it's not just to the individual, it's, it's a two-way street, like it, it goes both ways. So by coaching him through this system, his one goal in life in reality, which would be great of all of our employees, is whenever somebody said, oh, how'd you go, was to say, uh, I did what you taught me, I put in practice what we think is right, I mostly did better than I've ever done before, uh, and I happened to win these things. Whereas often we build cultures and organisations where we go all the way to the end, which is we've got to achieve this and we've got to do that, whereas the building blocks for employees will actually make sure that we get there. And so we've taken him from joining a company <coughs> into a job, onboarding him. He's now in the right job and with the right learning and development and now is getting the results both for him and then as it turns out for the organisation as well. Some of that took a little bit of time. So sometimes we put employees into roles that they aspire to. So hands up if you've had an organisation where you've said to employees, so what do you want to do? Right? Because that's engaging. But it's actually not always the right thing to do. Because they're not always ready to do it. And we should know how to get it to tell them. So when he qualified for state discus, he decided he should be a proper discus thrower. So instead of throwing it like this, which is the only way he could do it because he can't hold a discus. So his discus is that, that, and then that, turn the shoulder over. He then thought he'd put a spin in because that's what proper discus people do. So we were down the park, we go, right mate, let's do the cookie throw. So he did that, which is dead straight. We put a hat, I put a hat there, then I gave him 50 minutes to get past the hat. He could, which is a bit like lean and agile, I guess. You can spin any way you like, you can do whatever you want. But you can't do that forever, right? So 50, he had his 50 minutes of agility, and then, and then we went back to the, the normal throw. Because you have to go and perform, as you have employees in your company that need to perform with clients, and in that competition, there were people that could throw a lot further than him. These next couple of images uh, relate to all of those uh, aspects. Um, because once you get past that workforce foundations into talent management, then on to organisational excellence, there's lots of things that can do and don't happen which are kind of interchangeable. This is probably my favourite photo ever. Um, he looks pretty good now for a kid who couldn't jump off both feet. Um, you can see in the background, those other kids are actually uh, the best 100 metre runners in the state. Um, and they know that Loch there's something wrong with Lachlan because he's hanging out with people, a lot of people that have got something wrong. Right? And they're going, geez, that's actually not a bad jump. And so what you can see then is that after having a lot of practice, a lot of performance input, the right reward, the right skills development, uh, the performance occurring. This one is when he, uh, so just before he turned 15, he won the 800 metre state title, which is what, five years after not being able to run 800 metres. Um, again, because he'd been built up by us, the organisation and the club. Uh, in that event, he broke his personal best for the 400 metres in the first lap. He broke his personal best for the 800 metres in the second lap and then collapsed on the side of the track, which I thought was hilarious. My dad thought I was being a bit of an asshole, but, um, but he was then experienced lactic acid in his legs for the first time. So he'd gone so hard for so long on behalf of a club that he was now in pain on the side of the track, going, my leg, my leg, going, get up, it's great, it's bloody great. And dad's going, stop me alone, it's, it's funny. Anyway, um, but he loved it. But again, wouldn't you love an employee to have gone through that journey and then be doing that for you. And I think a lot of companies go, uh, the speaker before this talked about too far to company goals, too far to company vision. And I think that's a massive challenge with lots of organisations. They go way too far for that. There's no point talking about a culture where we're going to go to the moon, trying to attract the right people, and they go, look, I can't see any jet engines, I can only see propellers. Forgive me for saying this, and I can only see propeller heads. All right? Organisations have got to take people with them. And the last image 
is, I guess, a tribute to his legacy, but the legacy of both the employee and the club, the organisation, if you like. So this is with Lucia. This is his last state titles and her first state titles. He's not standing on a box. Um, Lucia has uh, dwarfed them. But they were then the most successful Paralympic sporting organisation in athletic at that point in time because they had an employee that partnered with them for ongoing success. And now they know how to teach everybody else how to do it. And in fact, they won uh, the Zone Representative Carnival on the back of both these kids for the first time in 12 years because they go in everything. So they go in seven events, and that's 14 points. And they won the, the title for the first time in 14 years by 10 points. So they get flogged at Zone Carnival because everybody's quicker. But their ability to contribute is extraordinary. And I use Lachlan's journey by way of example because it, it's a real journey of an employee joining an organisation and then the organisation rightly changing and partnering with the employee as they went. And it's based on a system, if you like, where the foundations have to be in place, then talent management, then organisational excellence. You can talk about culture and things. I get that and there's culture, each strategy for breakfast and all those sorts of arguments. And I, I firmly believe that performance will future proof you. And that's why it's in the middle. So we've been talking this morning about uh, 70, 70, 2010 and all those sorts of things. I think typically in organisations it's maybe 30, 30, 30, but they go from one to the other, flip in and out too much. Um, and I think in reality it probably should be 20, 70, 10. Because you don't need to tell the culture story or the strategy story very many times. But you do need to make sure everybody understands how it fits what they do. How it works in their role, how it works in their team, if we're tweaking the strategy, how we're tweaking the role, how we... and so that they can work on it together. Now, I don't think they need to be told uh, multiple occasions that this is the strategy. And I guess in closing, just before we have time for questions, is, uh, as it turns out, this is a picture of a unicorn from a company that is a unicorn, right? Does anybody recognise where that might come from? Canva. Yeah, it's Canva. The Canva is a unicorn that has pictures of unicorns, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, but their path to being, or their journey to being a unicorn is not a coincidence. <coughs> nor is it Lassians, nor are, are any of the paths of uh, the the tech companies that, to the external eye, have now look, seem to progress really quickly and develop really strongly. They went from, I think, two people in 2012 to 700 people now. Um, but they did a couple of things very deliberately. They chose to pay people above the odds. Uh, and I know that, that you know people are into culture and benefits and all those sorts of things, but um, I think that going into roles is a concept called the psychological contract which is as simple as, with an employee, uh, this is the job, this is what we'll pay you, this is what your team is like, this is what the leaders are like, this is what the organisation is like, and then the psychological contract measures the gap between what you promised and what you delivered. There are other parts of that, keeping them safe, etc. Um, but whether we like it or not, in large markets like this and Sydney, um, you know, paying people market rates, is a really important thing, and I think I think more companies should uh, look at that as a sign of intent. Because at the end of the day, with increasing mortgages uh, and cost of living, then um, you can't, rightly or wrongly, you can't pay for that with goodwill or culture. There literally needs to be some level of, of, of salary for certain. <coughs> um, so, in closing, what I wanted to do was leave you with three key thoughts. The first is that everything starts with that sense of affinity with some structure to, to generate energy and then on to synergy. Uh, that workforce foundations that are completely the right place to start, coupled with talent management and then on to organisational excellence as part of creating a people capital plan that sits beside a sales, marketing and finance plan. Um, I don't think, and I never was as an HR director with 
PepsiCo and with market research companies and some other smaller ones in my advisory work now. It doesn't have to be a perfect people plan, but I think the fact that there is a people plan that sits beside those other plans is, is a sign of intent uh, to existing employees and to new ones looking to come into the business too, particularly in terms of uh, growing, um, getting investment from other players, joint ventures, uh, representing, uh, and uh, who, which of you do tenders for government, for example, somebody to demonstrate capability or tenders for other sorts of work. So, you know, again, they're looking to see that people, companies have appropriately scoped out people plans that go with that. Um, and I think that the other part of it is it's okay to portray the, the vision and the culture of the company, but it needs to be embedded back into the roles of the individuals on the way through. So that's pretty much what I wanted to talk to you about this afternoon. I've flown through it, actually.